Thank you, Chris. I've been uh, given the task of speaking on the subject of defending the Trinity in this day and age. And before I do that, let me just uh, say a couple of things by way of preface. First of all, I want to tell you that in, in between this afternoon sessions and this evening, we had time for dinner. And so we went out to eat and got in all that traffic, and we went to the restaurant, and they told us there was a 35-minute wait. And I looked at my watch and did the calculations, and I thought, if it takes that long to be seated, uh, I'm not going to get back in time for this message. Well, there happened to be some folks in there who were part of this conference, and they saw the dilemma that I had, and they went up and talked to the owner and traded their time for hours to make sure that we were able to have our dinner. So, <laughs> Greater love hath no man than this, than to give up his reservation for a brother. <laughs> One of the questions I get frequently from people at my age is that they say, <clears throat> given your experience and where things are now in church history, what do you anticipate will be the greatest issue that the church will face in the next 25 to 50 years? And I always answer that question by saying that <clears throat> I'm not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, and I have no real insight as to what that problem will be. But if I guess, my guess will be that the great issue that we will face over the next decades, both inside the church and outside the church, will be with respect to the issue of the deity of Christ and consequently of our doctrine of the Trinity. And I say that for this reason, that in church history there have been four centuries where the church's affirmation of the deity of Christ was under attack with a vengeance. And those four centuries were the fourth century, which I'll be talking about a little later, God willing, the fifth century, the 19th century, and the 20th century. And the issues that surfaced in 19th century European liberalism with its all full-out assault on the deity of Christ carried over into the 20th century and did not end at the end of the 20th century. Those matters have carried over into our own day, and I see the issues being only exacerbated in the days to come. So I think it's imperative for Christians now to be prepared to defend our affirmation of the deity of Christ, and with it, a full orb confession of the classical doctrine of the Trinity. I've heard so many people attack the Trinity out of ignorance. I heard one philosopher make the comment that he could not ever be a Christian because at the heart of Christianity is this doctrine of the Trinity, which he said is a manifold or manifest contradiction in terms. And he said to believe a contradiction is to jump not into faith, but to credulity and to be a fool. And <clears throat> I agree with part of what he says. If I thought that the Christian faith was contradictory, I would sleep in tomorrow morning, and I wouldn't give it another five minutes of my devotion or consideration. If I thought the doctrine of the Trinity was contradictory, I would not affirm it, I would not believe it, and I would discard it in an instant. That may offend some of you who might think that I'm placing reason above God. I trust that that's not the case, but I am convinced that what God reveals, though is not something that we can always understand, it is never contradictory. And the church throughout church history has been extremely careful in her formulation of the Trinity, not to articulate it in contradictory categories, which I hope to show in a few moments. I've also heard 
Christian leaders describe the Trinity like this. Well, we believe that one plus one plus one equals one. Well, that's not only bad arithmetic, <laughs> it's ghastly theology, because that's not what we believe with respect to the Trinity. And so let's take some time here tonight to see what it is the church has believed and why over her history. And let me first pray before we do that. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we know that the first article of our theology is your incomprehensibility, that none of us has the capacity to plumb the, all the total depths of what you have revealed to us. But we rejoice in the clarity of what you have given to us in, insofar as we can grasp it. And so we ask that tonight you would stoop to our weakness, to our frailty, and the fragility even of our thinking, and assist us by the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit, who is also the Spirit of truth. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to begin by reading a very short passage of Scripture, but an extremely important passage of Scripture with respect to the subject that we're considering tonight uh, about the Trinity. I'm looking, of course, at the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, to the prologue beginning at verse 1 and reading through verse 5. That's John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> we read these words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, when I say these first five verses of John's Gospel have an enormous significance, I am thinking, first of all, of church history. In this five verses, we have reference to the Word. And the word word here translates the Greek word for word, the Greek word logos or logos. And in the first 300 years of theological reflection by the strongest minds that God gifted the church with in those early centuries, the virtually the entire focus of their insight was on these five verses. That is what we call Logos Christology dominated the reflection of the Christian church for the first 300 years of her history. And I would say also that it is because of these first five verses of John's Gospel that the Christian church found it necessary to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity. And that which made it necessary was not only the teaching here positively of what is written in John's prologue, but also uh, because of the attacks against Christianity from heretics. One of the great side benefits of heresy throughout church history is that heresy always forces the church to greater precision and clarity about what we do believe and what the Bible teaches so that we may differentiate the truth of sacred Scripture from the distortions 
and falsehoods carried about by heresy. Now, there are some strange things found in these opening verses. And there's a little piece of irony that most people will not catch as they read the first line of the verse, of the first five verses, unless they are reading it in the Greek and have some understanding of the Greek. Now, I am not an expert in Greek, but I do know a little Greek. He's a tailor. <laughs> I took my trousers to him, and he looked at me, and he said, Euripides? And I said, yes. And he said, Imenides. <laughs> so, so I know a little Greek. But we read here the first three words of John's gospel that echo the first three words of the book of Genesis, in the beginning. Now that's three words in English. In the Greek, it's two words, and those two words are N-R-K, and the word R-K is translated by the English word beginning. Now, if you'll indulge me for a moment, that word R-K has an enormous history behind us. In Greek philosophy, the ultimate quest of the Greek philosopher was to find what they called the R.K. principle that will explain all of reality. Because that Greek word R.K. can be translated not only by the English word beginning, as it is here, but the word R.K. means, or can be translated, beginning, or chief, or ruler. And when the Greek philosophers were searching for the R.K. principle, they were searching for ultimate reality, the ultimate ruling principle that explains everything that there can be. The chief idea, the big idea that is foundational to our understanding of all that there is. Now, you're familiar with the use of this term, R.K., when it becomes carried over into the English language, usually as a preface that we use in English and translate it with the word arch. We've heard of arch bishops, arch enemies, or in a shortened version, archangels. There are angels, then there are archangels. Now, what's the difference between an ordinary angel and an archangel? An archangel is a boss angel. An archangel is a chief angel. He's a ruling angel of a bunch, over a bunch of lesser angels. An archbishop is a bishop who is ruling over many priests and the rest in the church. And you may have enemies or rivals, like the Pittsburgh Steelers. We have rivals. And then we have the Baltimore Ravens, who are arch rivals, <laughs> chief rivals. They rise to the level of enemy in our football language. So you get the idea of what the word arch means. And it's interesting that John uses it right here, being translated beginning. Now, when the Greeks sought for that arch principle, that archetypal idea, 
they ask the question, is that ruling principle ultimately one, or is it many? Is it more than one? Is it a plurality or a singularity? And the idea that ultimately came to bear in Greek philosophy was that the ultimate principle by which everything was to be understood was a single reality, a single principle, what they called a monoarche. Now you're starting to get the taste for that word in the English language. A monoarche, or shorten it to monarchy. And when we talk about monarchs, we usually think of what? Kings or queens. And nations that are ruled by kings are called monarchies because it has a single, ultimate, authoritative ruler. Now, Judaism, at its core, confessed a peculiar type of monarchy. There is only one ultimate ruling being who is the foundational being and principle of all that there is. He is the king of the universe, the supreme monarch, and <clears throat> there's only one of them. That's why Judaism, at its core, celebrated what we call monotheism, one God. Now, the problem that the early Christian church faced in dealing with her theology was that the Christian community of the first century was totally committed to monotheism. They embraced the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And so they also understood that the most foundational sin of fallen humanity is the sin of idolatry. And what idolatry involves is the worship and service of an idol who is not God. Paul develops that in Romans 1, that the fundamental sin of the human race is to exchange the truth of God for a lie and serve and worship the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. And so to ascribe worship to anything less than God would be to fall into the worst type of idolatry. Now remember that the Christian faith grew out of Judaism. And with the embracing of Jesus, there was not at the same time a repudiation of classic biblical monotheism. But the difficulty that the church had in understanding her faith was to reconcile the multitude of references in the Scripture that would indicate the Bible's teaching that Jesus was God incarnate. He shares titles that belong only to God, ego emi, the I am formulas of John. He is given the supreme title that is given only to God, Adonai, the very name Lord, is a title reserved for God and for God alone. He got himself in all kinds of trouble with the Pharisees when he claimed for himself prerogatives that every Jew said believe uh, belong only to God. Jesus healed people on the Sabbath, and when that created such an outroar by his contemporaries, he said, I did this 
so that you may know the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, if the Pharisees were angry before Jesus said that, <laughs> their anger became exponential when they heard it, what He said, because when He said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, they got the message. They said, wait a minute, Jesus. God's the Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus was saying, yes. <laughs> and, and on another occasion, He heals a person's sins. And they say, who do you think you are? And I do this, Jesus said, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Which again, the Pharisees said, wait a minute, that's a divine prerogative. So you have this problem. Steve gave that masterful defense of the resurrection, and he made brief reference to Thomas and his skepticism. And when Jesus appeared in the upper room to him and invited him to put his hands into his side and to look and put his fingers into the wounds in his hands, we don't know if Thomas ever did that. We know that what he did do was fall on his knees saying, my Lord and my God, and responded in a posture of worship. Now, notice in the book of Acts when Paul and Silas and Barnabas and are on their journeys and they do marvelous things that people will bow down to them, and they rebuke them. Don't worship us. We're just human beings. And even the angels, if people seek to worship them, the angels routinely and characteristically rebuke those who would ascribe worship to them because they understood that worship belongs only to God. And to give any worship to anything less than God, as I said, is blasphemous and idolatrous. Well, in the beginning we read in John was the Word, the Logos. The Logos that was in the beginning. And we read and the Word was with God, pros theon. Now, the Greek has <clears throat> three different words that can be translated by the English word with. There is para, which means alongside, right? Uh, there is we have paramedics, paralegals that work alongside the legals and the medics, and we have paraministries that work alongside the church and so on. Para means to be with, that is beside somebody. They have the word sun, which we get the word, the prefix syn, S-Y-N, where you synchronize your watches and make them read the same. And the Jews came together when they would gather corporately, they came to the synagogue, the synagogue. That was the place where the people were with each other. So that's to be with other people in a group. And then they had this word pros, the root of which makes up the most of the word prosepon, which is the Greek word for face. And the idea with pros is that withness is in a face-to-face -face relationship, the closest possible relationship that two people can have is not to be beside one another, but to be with one another in this face-to-face -face relationship. And so John tells us that the Logos, who was in the beginning, was pros, God, with God in this intensely close-knit relationship. But so far, what we've heard is that the Logos is being distinguished from God. There's God and then there's the Logos. There's God and the one who's with God. That would suggest, on the surface at least, 
two different entities, wouldn't it? God and somebody with God. Now you're beginning to see, well, some people count one plus one, you know. But then everything <laughs> explodes with the next assertion in the prologue. And the Word was God. The Logos was not only with God in the beginning, not only crossed God face to face, but now it is said flat out, He was God. So that the deity of the Logos is clearly confessed here by John in this writing. Do you see why the church then had to go to the drawing board and said, how can we understand this? How can someone be on the one hand identified with God and on the other hand distinguished from God? So that you have an identity and a distinction. And therein came the development of Trinitarian theology. Now, the two great attacks in the early centuries against Trinitarian thinking that was drawn from John chapter 1 were two different types of monarchianism. Now, we've already labored the meaning of that idea of monarchy, and a monarchianism is an ism that is related to the concept of one reigning being. And the two kinds of monarchianism that threatened historic Christianity were called, first of all, modalistic monarchianism, and second of all, dynamic monarchianism. Now, you've all heard about modalistic monarchianism, and if I gave a pop quiz to you all and said, would you give me a quick definition of modalistic monarchianism? You could surely all do that, right? <laughs> How many of you have never heard of modalistic monarchianism? I'm looking at those people who, come on, let me see those hands, because the people that haven't raised their hands, I'm going to call on <laughs> to ask ask them to give a definitive definite. Let me see the hands again. How many have never heard of modalistic? Ah, oh, no. Yeah, all right. How many of you have heard of it, but you still couldn't define it? Ah. Is there anybody left out there? Well, let me take a moment to explain and define modalistic monarchianism because it was one of the most severe threats to the Christian faith that the church had to face in the early days. You've all heard of Gnosticism. The Gnostics of the second century, and actually in the late first century, the Gnostics were called Gnostics because <clears throat> the Greek word to know is the word gnosis, gnosis, but it's pronounced gnosis. And you have, you get that word all the time. When you go to the doctor, you're looking for what? A diagnosis. And if the diagnosis is not a friendly one, the next thing you want to have is a prognosis. And tell me how this thing is going to carry on from here. And so the Gnostics were that group of people who claimed that they had a special knowledge a special mystical insight to truth that was superior to the apostles. And that knowledge did not come through rational inquiry or through scientific experimentation and examination, but it came through this immediate mystical insight. And not everybody enjoyed the gift of gnosis. Only the Gnosticoi the Gnosticoi were not Gnostic fish. The Gnosticoi 
I just want to see if you're awake here. <laughs> we did have a heavy dinner. The Gnosticoi were the people in the know. Well, the Gnostics not only had this system of knowledge, but they had a view of reality that was very pantheistic or modalistic. And their idea is that ultimate reality was one, but this ultimate reality or being sent out emanations from the center. And the further away from the core that these emanations radiated, the lower level of reality you had. So that you would go from from God, to the angels, to people, to animals, to vegetables, to rocks. And you get down to the rock, and the rock is an emanation from the core being that's so far away from the center that there's not much of the substance of the emanation or the, of the reality to be found in it, but it's still part of a being. It's still pantheism. Now, in the third century, there was a teacher who adopted this idea of different levels of beings that were modes of being that flow out of the core being. And this man's name was Sibelius. And Sibelius was a modalistic monarchian. And that means simply, I mean, this is easy stuff. That means, he said, that, that Jesus and the Logos are divine in the sense that they participate, the Logos participates in the very being of God, in the very essence of God but is at a lower level than the level of God. You with me? His favorite analogy was the sun and the ray that comes from the sun. We see sun, the rays of the sun shining on their earth, and we know that they partake of the essence of light and of the sun but we don't associate those with the core ball of fire that's up there that gives light and heat to the world. These sunbeams radiate out from the center of the sun. They're of the same stuff or the same essence as the sun, but they are not the sun. You understand that? So the next time you sing, Jesus wants me to be a sunbeam. You think of Sibelius and his heresy. <laughs> now, the way, the language that Sibelius used to articulate his view was that the Logos, that we call the second person of the Trinity, was of the same essence as God. Homo, meaning same, usios. And if you know anything about Greek, that little tailor I know, the word usios is the present participle of the verb to be. So you can translate the word usios by the English word being or substance, essence, and if those are too high, stuff, okay? So Sibelius was saying that the Logos, of which John speaks, is of the same stuff, the same essence, the same substance as God, but was not God. 
just as the sunbeam cannot be identified with the sun. You got it? Now, in 267, at Antioch, Sibelius was condemned as a heretic, and the term homo usios of the same substance or essence was condemned as a heretical concept. That's important for us to, to realize that. The church categorically rejected the term homo usios there in the third century in 267 at Antioch. And then what happened? The threat from modalistic monarchianism began to dissipate and pass away. But a new threat arose that was even worse. And this new threat was called dynamic monarchianism. Dynamic monarchianism, not modalistic monarchianism. You know what that means now. But dynamic monarchianism, which dynamic means something that progresses or moves, is alive, it changes. And the chief exponent of this doctrine was a man whose name was Arius, A-R-I-U-S. And he developed the idea that the Logos was a high being, but was a created being, the most elevated being of all beings apart from God, the firstborn of all creation, the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father, and so the Logos enjoyed the highest posture in the universe except for God, high enough that we could worship Him, but not to be seen as God. And his chief argument revolved around the use of the Greek word ganao, ginomai, which is translated to be, to become, or to happen. We get the word generation from that. We get the word genesis from that. And in Greek categories, anything that has been begotten means that there was a time that it did not exist. And when it was begotten, at the moment it was begotten, that's the moment it started to be. And since the Bible speaks of Jesus being the firstborn of creation and being the only begotten of the Father, Arius is saying that the Bible itself denies the deity of Christ, but rather affirms that he had a beginning because the Bible uses the term begotten with respect to Christ. Now, <clears throat> this provoked a fierce controversy that threatened the unity of the entire Roman Empire, and the sons of Constantine were deeply involved in the uh, arguments and debates that went on. We've heard of St. Athanasius, who defended the full deity of Christ over against Arian, and this whole issue came to a head in 325 at the Council of Nicaea. Now, you know the Apostles' Creed, and many of you know the Nicene Creed. Was it here that Steve Lawson referred to the Nicene Creed, or was that on the ship? Here? Ship. On the ship. Okay. Well, 
some strange things happened at Nicaea. And without going into all the details, at the end of the day, the church declared, condemning Arius as a heretic, the church declared that the Logos, the second person of the Trinity, was homoousios, with God. Now, in 267, they condemned that word and said that, that Christ was homoousios, like God. But they shrunk back in horror from saying He is God because homoousios carried all the baggage of modalism. You got it? And so here's what happened. From 267 to 325, the church did a 180. Not because the church had changed its mind, but because they realized that Arius was using the language that the church approved in 267, homoiousios, to deny the deity of Christ. Now, Arius went into some really silly stuff where he says, well, Jesus was not God, but He sort of became God when He was adopted by the Father, and that's why it was called dynamic monarchianism and a, a heretical form of adoptionism, but that's for another day. But the important point they have to understand here is that the church, when saying no to Sibelius, said the church, we believe that Christ was homoiousios, not homo. Now, when we get to Arius, who says he's homoi, but not homo, the church now embraces the formula that Jesus, or the Logos, is homo usios, of the same essence. And herein is the historic definition of the Trinity, that the Logos is of the same essence. The Nicene Creed says that the second person is co-eternal and co-substantial with the Father, meaning there was no time in which the Logos didn't exist. But the Logos has existed from all eternity, and the Logos is of the same essence as the Father, and yet is distinguished from the Father. But the distinction between the Father and the Son and then also the Holy Ghost was not what we would call an essential distinction, because the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are all homoousios. They are the same essence, the same being. There's only one being, and we call God. But that one being is triune. He, that one single being or essence is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Again, if you're familiar with the Nicene Creed, you have those strange words with respect to the Logos, who was begotten, comma, not made. Begotten, not made. That is what Nicaea was saying, is that the language of the New Testament that speaks of Christ being the firstborn, that speaks of Christ being the only begotten, that begottenness there is not used in biological categories but rather in relational categories, that the Father and the Son are of the same essence, although they have a different persona or subsistence. And part of the thing we struggle with, and we use the formula that God is one in essence, three in person, the thing that's really difficult here is when Nicaea talked about person or persona, it was not using it in exactly the same way we use the term person. 
When we talk about a person, we are individuating this guy from this guy. We figure one person, one being. Or one being, one person. We've never conceived of anything that was one being, yet three persons. And the word persona came from the Greek theater, where you've seen the symbols of the theater, where you see a mask with a smile on it, and that smile indicates that the play is what kind of a play? Comedy. And then if you see the other mask with the sarpus on it, what does that indicate? It's a tragedy. I had the privilege with Vesta before we were married over 52 years ago. The privilege, wait a minute, wait, time on. We weren't married over 52 years ago. We won't be married for 52 years until Monday. <laughs> They're applauding me. Or is it us? Maybe it's you. But in any case, we saw this play in New York before we were married. Her father took us to New York and we had tickets to the play called J.B. Then you heard that, a modern version of the story of Job. And the lead character was Basil Rathbone, who played Sherlock Holmes and also the Sheriff of Nottingham in the classical movie of Robin Hood. We sat on the first row, and Basil Rathbone was here. I mean, he was closer than I am to you right now. He was eight feet away from me. I could have got up and reached out and touched him. And he had two parts in that play. He was God, and he was the devil. And how did you know whether he was speaking as God or of the devil? He had two different masks. When he was God, he spoke through one mask. When he was the devil, he spoke through the devil's mask. Now, you know what those masks were called in the ancient Greek theater? Persona. Persona. They were the ways in which different characters were manifested. And that's why in church history and theology, the term that we use most frequently to, to deal with the Trinity is the word subsistence. There is one essence, one being, but in that of being are three subsistences under existences, if you will, which we call the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Not three beings, as Paul Crouch teaches, tritheism, that heresy. No, no, no. No, no, no. One being, three persons. Now, go back to what I said at the beginning. Heard a philosopher saying, that's a contradiction. No, it isn't. If I use logical categories in formulation and I say that something that is one in essence and three in essence, they're giving me a signal, don't lean on this thing, I might come tumbling down. All right, I won't lean on it. If something, if I say that something is one in essence and only one in essence and it's three in essence. Now I speak with a forked tongue. Now I'm speaking contradiction. Because the law of non-contradiction states that something cannot be A and non-A at the same time and in the same relationship. Now the church's formulation for the Trinity does not violate that. Rather we say that God is one in one thing, in essence, one in A, Three in person. It's not the same as saying there's one in A and three in A. One in essence and three in essence. He's one in being, three in person. It's a mystery. None of us have been able to fathom the depths of that, but it is not irrational. It is not absurd. It is not a contradiction. And 
Most importantly, it is faithful to the Scriptures, who tell us that the second person of the Trinity is God, and it is the second person who became incarnate, and that the fullness of the God had dwelt within Him bodily, so that the divine nature of Jesus is of the same essence as the Father. Now, when you get to Christology in the next century, and I won't have time to get into the Council of Chalcedon, where the two natures of Christ are taught, that Christ is one in person, Jesus is one in person, two in nature, two in essence. This one person has a divine essence and a human essence, right? So there you do have two essences in one person, just the opposite of the Trinity, one essence, three persons. You got it? All right. So the church ever since then has guarded the boundaries of our reflection and saying as difficult as it is to conceive the depths and the riches of the Godhead, we have to understand that there is a unity of being in the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and yet we must distinguish within the Godhead the persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Finally, at Nicaea, when the battle waged hot, the Arians used to ridicule the Trinitarians, and they wrote body songs and jingles insulting the Christians, and they would stand on one side of the river, sing these mocking songs attacking the Trinitarians. And the Christians would stand on the other side of the river, and they composed their own fight song that they answered the Arians with. And here's the words of that song. They would stand on the edge of the river, and they would sing, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Take that, you Arians. <laughs> so, the next time you sing the Gloria Patra, remember that you are singing the Christian fight song, defending the biblical and the ecclesiastical affirmation that the glory that belongs to God belongs to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost now and forevermore. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this glorious truth of the intricate composition, which is not a composition, of Your very being. Help us to understand the depths and the riches that dwelt in the Logos, who was with you in the beginning and was not only with you, but was you. And we thank you in his name. Amen.